Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue our study in the book of Daniel. But before we get started, let's make sure that we confess our sins and that we are controlled by the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this privilege and the time, even the health and the air that we breathe, to study your word. We ask that our hearts will be open to your truth, our minds will be ready. In Jesus' name, amen. Now last time we learned about the King of the North, who's the Antichrist, invading the south into the Middle East and on down to the borders of Egypt which is in North Africa. We saw that he took down this area and of the Middle East and it came under his control. <clears throat> Now, remember that this also happened during the tribulation period. This is the midpoint right here in the middle. And this is the end. We also have the trumpet judgments. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven actually occurs about the mid-trib. All right, so we're about at this point towards the end of the, uh, what should I say, how should I put it? We're towards the end, almost at the midpoint, towards the end of the first half. How's that? So we're just about at that point when he makes these invasions to the south. He has his first invasion and then he has a second one. And we looked just briefly last time at the sixth trumpet where God allows Satan and his demons to have these killer angels come on the world and destroy millions of unbelievers. Now let me make this clear. God is always in control. He never even lets the devil get out of control. But he lets the devil do certain things. And in this case, he lets the devil kill these people. He lets them. And this is a warning to the world that things are going to get worse and they need to turn to Christ. But many do not. Most do not. So the king of the north is invading the south. Okay? Let's put this down here on a smaller map. So the king of the north has been invading the south. In his first invasion, if you remember, let's see, let's use, let's use this blue. In his first invasion, he went south down to about the borders of Egypt. He came back and he had his first desecration. So the blue is the first invasion and desecration. Remember that big long word we looked at? Of the temple. Now, on his second trip, he's going to go again. We'll make this red. He's going to go all the way down into Egypt. And that's what we're going to study now. His second invasion of the south and second desecration of the temple. Now, the result this time will be different. Verse 30 tells us why. For ships of Kittim, 
will come with him. Actually, in this translation, I explained it in the adult version. But in this translation, when he comes down there, when this is, has to do with the Antichrist and not Antiochus, the ships are on his side. If you remember the first time that these ships were against him, and remember who they were with, the Romans. But remember, this time, the Antichrist controls Rome. So these ships of Kittim are with him. A big change. It also says, Therefore he will be disheartened and will return and become enraged at the Holy Covenant and take action. He'll return and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Now, this is a little difficult to understand, so let's, let's go through it a little bit of time. Now, I just mentioned the ships of Kittim. This is the navy. The navy... First with Antiochus, it was Rome. But now, remember, all these empires are bigger now. Everything has spread out across the world. So when we come to the time of the Antichrist, we're involving the whole world's nations. And Kittim represents the Western navies, which would most likely be that of Babylon. Since it's outside of Europe, it may be the, the navies, well, I don't know if it's going to be called the United States, but it may be the navies of the West, including the United States. So they come over and help him conquer the Middle East. But he still gets disheartened. Now, why would he get disheartened since he actually conquered this area down there? Well, this is a little complicated, so listen carefully. We know that during this time, let's go back to our timeline. We know that it's about this time that he is assassinated. Now assassinated is a long word they use for important people being murdered. But he gets shot or somehow receives a fatal, that means a deadly wound. And then he comes back alive. He's imitating the resurrection. And this is what this disheartening means here. It does what we call foreshadows. It sort of points to it. But remember, this is a dual application passage that applies both to the uh, type Antichrist, or Antiochus and the anti-type, the Antichrist. So, he's disheartened here but it represents what's going to really happen, his being killed. Now, is he really killed? I don't think so. But it makes it look like he is so much that people believe he's died. So when he comes back to life, they think he must be God with special powers. And if he can do that to himself, maybe he can do it for you. So let's worship him, you see. Well, this verse tells us that not only does he win the rest of the South, but he gets assassinated. Now, who did it? I don't know. It doesn't tell us. It could be a, a person from Israel. I wouldn't say as a believer. 
but still lots of unbelievers in Israel, mostly unbelievers. And many of them will be against this Antichrist. So maybe one of them uh, appeared to have killed the Antichrist. And he will take out his rage in the second decorate, des, desecration of the temple. So we have the second desecration, but this one is much worse, okay? Because it's this one where he goes in and sets up the image and proclaims with the false prophet that he's going to rule the world and that everyone should worship him. You see? So, the second invasion and the second desecration means that the Antichrist, who's the king of the north, will go down to the south. He will conquer Egypt. He will go on and return back up to the temple area, but this time he's going to completely take it over. So he is going to break completely that seven-year covenant that he made with Israel and demand that people worship him. And people will. Oh, they're going to love him. They're going to think he's the greatest thing that ever came along. And many will start to say he's the Christ. But you see, they really don't understand who Christ is. If you just have little knowledge about him, and don't really believe in him and follow him and study your word, you can easily be misled. In fact, Jesus said, don't be deceived because many will claim to be Christ. He said that while he was back on earth. Well, the people of the world will think that this is amazing, that he's come back to life, and they're ready to worship him. And even the, he has another man come up to help him, what the Bible calls a second beast, who is a false prophet. He's kind of like the big preacher who will come and say that this Antichrist is the one we must worship. And they'll back it up by miracles. That's right. Satan and his people can do miracles, the supernatural. Remember, they're angels or fallen angels. They already have powers that humans don't have, so they'll have all kinds of tricks up their sleeves to fool people into thinking that they are doing God's work. And of course, it won't be long before they'll be claiming that the Antichrist is the God they are to worship. Let's go to a passage in Revelation for a moment where it talks about the assassination of the Antichrist. Revelation 13, 14. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, this is talking about the false prophet, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth he ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Well, remember, the sword was the big weapon back in those days, even back during the time of John, the apostle who wrote this. What would be the equivalent of a sword today? Probably a gun. But we don't know for sure. It may have been a knife. But anyway, what happens is, is that this second beast comes along. The first beast is the Antichrist. And then another person comes along who's the false prophet. He supports the Antichrist. They call him a beast also. And when we think of the word beast, it's exactly that. Something wild, uncontrollable, dangerous. Stay away from him. 
So the second beast, who is a false prophet, he will come along. He has his image set up in the temple. He's deceiving. Did you notice that part? Let me show you verse 13, or chapter 13, verse 14 again. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the beast, this is talking about the false prophet, he, the false prophet, deceived the inhabitants of the earth. People will be fooled by their miracles, thinking that they're from God, when in fact they're from Satan. Then look at this last line of our verse. Let's go back to our verse. Let me just put uh, that part of the last line up there, okay? This is our verse in Daniel. He will return and show regard, that means honor, for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. So, the Antichrist is going to honor those who turn against the covenant, the temple worship, the worship of the true God. The Antichrist is going to worship, or excuse me, he's going to honor those who turn against God, who forsake the Holy Covenant. It almost sounds just the opposite of what we would be expecting to see, but you think about it, this is the Antichrist. And he's going to honor those who turn against the true God, who support him in the killing of Moses and Elijah. And if you remember the 144,000 evangelists, the Jews that are sent around the world to tell people that Jesus is the Messiah. So, the Antichrist is going to go back, have his image set up in the temple, in the middle of the tribulation, and people are going to start to worship him. And they're going to start to follow him and begin to see him as God. So he takes his seat in the temple. The false prophet proclaims him as the Messiah. And all are demanded to worship him. And they have miracles to back this up. I'm going to put the next verse at the bottom of the screen because it talks more about the second desecration. Forces from him will arise, profane the fortified sanctuary. That is the temple that has been is being defended by some. They abolish the, they abolish the regular sacrifices. That would be the ones that Moses and Elijah taught them to do and set up the abomination that causes desolation. That's a term for the image. It's an abomination. It's something horrible. Anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Christian. And people who don't worship it, they will be desolated. He will seek to have them destroyed. So in this second desecration, again, the Antichrist re-enters Jerusalem, but this time with vengeance. Perhaps because it was a person from Israel who had assassinated him. But that's all in Satan's plan to again, to promote his man, just like it was to have the Mahdi or the king of the south go down so they can hand it all over to the Antichrist. And now this move makes the rest of the world worship him. So the Antichrist is considered a great war leader, a great military commander, a miracle worker backed by this false prophet, a person who's come back to life and he's set up in the temple to worship. He will go in to this place in Israel, the temple in Jerusalem. 
and he will destroy any opposition. And much of the world will support him because they think he's doing the right thing. In verse 32, we hear how some of his speech works. I'll put it at the bottom of the screen. And those who are acting wickedly toward the covenant, he will corrupt with flattering words. But the people who know their God will be strong and take action. Now let's look at this a sentence at a time. And those who are acting wickedly toward the covenant. This is those who are against what Moses and Elijah did. Those who are acting against the covenant are against the agreement. They're against the worship system that's been set up to worship the true God. These people, the Antichrist, will corrupt them further, make them even worse by using flattering words. You say, well, you're just doing the right thing. This is what you should be doing, getting rid of those people like Moses and Elijah and people who study that Bible. He'll corrupt them even further. But then on the other side, there are the people who know their God and they will be strong and they will take action. Now with Antiochus, during the time of Antiochus, when this was first fulfilled historically, we learned about the Maccabees. But now, in the future, you're not going to have a revolt by believers. In fact, we're going to see that the Lord leads believers out of there. Okay? So, let me just kind of summarize what we have. The king of the north, the Antichrist, now controls all the south. It comes under his control. He sets himself up, seats himself in the temple. His sidekick, the false prophet, sets up this image. And they use miracles and demand everybody worship them. So basically at this point, in the middle of the tribulation, if you want to look at the chart, in the middle of the tribulation, he becomes the world ruler. And everyone will worship him except two groups. Believers and those who think he's full of bunk. A lot of them will be Jews. They'll say, this isn't the Messiah. And they will not take that mark. Believers won't take the mark, and neither will those who know that he's not only not the Messiah, but he's going to do damage to their country. Now, we're going to also learn that the Antichrist is going to go after all believers. He can't have them disrupting his plan, telling people about what's going on, or exposing him for what he really is. So he's going to go out and try to destroy Christians. In the meantime, what are Christians doing? Verse 33 tells us. Those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. Yet they will fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity, and by plunder for many days. Well, you might say this is the sad part, but this is also a good part for believers. You see, they're the ones who have insight. That's what you're getting right now. You're learning the scripture. You're given insight. You're given the truth about these matters so you won't fall for the Antichrist. You'll know that that's exactly who he is. You'll know what he's doing. 
you know, know that he'll rule Babylon, he'll rule Rome one, then expand to Rome two, and that'll all happen pretty fast. Now listen, this will probably happen in your lifetime. If you're younger than a teenager, uh, even older than that, it may well happen within your lifetime, and we need to look out for these things and be ready and be strong and be mature as Christians and be ready for whatever God has to test us with. You see? Those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. Right now, you are getting understanding. We are getting insight from the Word of God so you can understand what's going on. Yet, don't miss this part, they will fall by the sword. The Antichrist will go after many Christians and have them killed. By flame, well that probably represents houses being burned, perhaps torture. It doesn't really give us the detail. Some will be captured. Plunder, that means they'll take your property. If you have a house, they may take your house if they want it. But, you know, God gives us strength. God prepares us for these things by learning the Word of God and trusting Him. Now, there's a couple of things you should have learned already from the book of Daniel. We see it even in the life of Daniel. When he did the right thing, evil people would try to hurt him. They tossed him into the lion's den. God protected him. Remember his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how they refused to worship that statue that Nebuchadnezzar set up, and they were thrown into the fiery furnace, and they survived, not only survived, but didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. Not a hair on their body was burned. So, we prepare ourselves as soon as we can. I teach my children these things, and some of them I started very young. As soon as they started to be able to understand, I started teaching them to be prepared for not only following Jesus, but what the world, the devil, and the flesh is going to throw at them. And that's what we need to do, to be ready to follow Jesus at all cost. So this verse tells us, those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. Bible teachers, believers who know the word, are going to tell others, that's the Antichrist. We don't follow him. We follow Jesus. Jesus is going to come back and destroy the Antichrist. And for telling people that, they're going to suffer. But just like Daniel, if that's God's will, so be it. Stay strong. Stay faithful. And what's the worst that could happen? Oh, you could die and go be with Jesus. Boy, there's nothing bad about that, is there? But you know what's going to be sad? Jesus told us some of the things that's going to happen where family members, those who really don't follow Jesus, are going to turn in other family members. That's something that's hard to accept, but that's the truth. Luke 21, 16. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You know, every person has to decide to trust in Jesus for themselves. Your parents can't do it for you. You can't do it for your little brothers or sisters. Everyone has to choose themselves. Right? You choose each one of us choose to follow Jesus. And we pray that our parents and brothers and sisters and relatives will all be saved. 
but not all will. We just have to accept that not everyone's going to be saved. And sometimes it's a relative. It may be a grandmother or a grandfather or a cousin. But if you live during the time of the Antichrist, some of them are going to follow the Antichrist. And if they have the opportunity, they may betray you. But that's not happened yet. And we ask God that all these relatives and brothers and friends and cousins and parents and grandparents will all be saved. We give them the gospel. We challenge them to follow Jesus at all costs. Well, we're going to go under great trial even to prepare for this terrible time. The Apostle Paul wrote, have you heard of this verse? I bet you have. It's a very popular one. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. So you want to put on this full armor. Know the word. Know that you're going to follow Jesus. Know that you're saved. In the power of the Spirit, you stand for Christ. Well, we'll continue at this point next time. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. We thank you for the challenge that you've given us, not only in telling us what's going to happen in the future, but in preparing us every day through the study of your word. Lord, we ask that your spirit will move us to read your word, to study it, to have insight so we can follow you faithfully. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.